let's say, you know, this distance is sufficiently far away, there is no risk of my raining on you if you sit in the front. So, uh, I don't, unless of course the view is better from there or something like that. So, don't be shy, uh, and I don't throw things at the audience, and if I do, I'm sure I can reach up there anyway. Uh, let, I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the work that's done at Microsoft Research, but uh, from what I understand, you know, many of you are MBA students and uh, students who are not necessarily computer science students and uh, would probably, you know, take a more broad approach. So just to calibrate myself, how many of you are computer science students? Pretty much all of you, then. <laughs> okay, so the MBA students didn't show up. How many of you are MBA students? Oh, simple number. I think some of you raised your hands twice. Does your, <laughs> <laughs> does your advisor know that? Okay, so, um, I mean, I'm going to keep it fairly light, and if you at any time feel like uh, asking a question or stopping me to something, feel free to do so. I, I, I may have to go a bit fast because I have a bunch of stuff to show you. My purpose here is not so much to educate, but to entertain and inform. I mean, I always say that all talks have to be after dinner talks, right, you know, because they should be entertaining to the audience. So Microsoft, uh, most of us, I'm sure all of you know what Microsoft is, and uh, and I think the only name that's more universally, less universally, uh, more universally known than Bill Gates uh, seems to be, uh, you know, Michael Jackson or somebody like that. You know, everybody knows Bill Gates. Wherever I go, said, ha, have you met, you know, Bill or something like that. Uh, so, you know, you quickly saw what was there and let me explain what this was. Back in uh, 1991, Microsoft was not a very big company. It had a total revenue of a billion dollars. And uh, Nathan Marwald was the chief technology officer. He is actually, uh, you know, quite a distinguished scientist, a mathematician and physicist by background. Somehow ended up, uh, you know, with Bill Gates early on. And he proposed that Microsoft should start a research lab because, you know, the reason that he mentioned earlier, which is, um, you know, really from a memo that he wrote. And his main point was, you know, there is a lot of growth in software technology. And his whole idea is that if you want to really shape the future, you have to invest in it by doing basic research. So when Microsoft Research was set up, it was set up with the mission goal, first to do basic research in whatever area that we work in, and then of course to uh, impact Microsoft through our research and transfer our ideas into multiple products, but then also have a long-term view of technology and the company and, and the industry and so on. Now, the one thing that we want to mention is a lot of time when you think about uh, corporate you know, R&D labs, and there's a difference first of all between R&D and R, so we call it uh, little r, big D versus just big R. Most of the time when someone says an R&D center, they're not doing uh, research for research sake, it's not curiosity driven, it's driven by the needs of the products and the business opportunities the company sees. So a product may be shaping which will then influence you know, what kind of ideas they investigate and explore and so on. Whereas when you do pure research, uh, you're not driven by that, you do what you want to do. So researchers that work in our lab basically do whatever they want to do. Uh, of course they have to be successful in what they are doing uh, and that is measured by many criteria which I will explain. I think many of you are probably not familiar with the whole process of the social process of research, how researchers you know, become researchers and how they do those kind of things. So I'm going to try to explain that uh, just a little bit, right? And one way to do that is really, um, you know, to reflect back on my own career. So I did my B.Tech in uh, electrical engineering, um, electronics in IIT, from IIT Madras in 1977, before many of you here were born, I think. Uh, and then uh, went to the U.S. to do a master's. I actually uh, didn't do a PhD right away because I thought, you know, I may, I'm not sure I wanted to continue uh, in, in research. So I worked at Intel in its early days. Uh, I mean, on the software side, I, I don't do much hardware. And then I, you know, after a couple of years, I realized that I could do this job and um, continue doing it for a long time and probably do well and, you know, become, uh, take on more responsibilities, enjoy it. And it was quite a, you know, nice job actually. And this was uh, the late 70s or early 80s. This was pre-dot-com, the word dot-com didn't even exist, the internet didn't exist. And so, you know, we were at a time uh, when we weren't really sure the future of computers were. You know, desktops, home PC did not exist. Um, you know, we were looking at small computers and they were called microprocessor systems that Intel used to work on and that was partly what I was on. Microsoft itself, I don't know whether it existed in 81 or, you know, it's just about to come into picture. So, it, it's, it's very old, the, the story here. And, uh, you know, I, I felt that 
you know, on the other hand, if I went to do my PhD and started doing research, I'll just open up a whole new space of ideas and, and could, could explore things. So it was a bit risky because, um, you know, I could stay and have a steady job and then going off and do PhD. Of course, going to do PhD means that five or six more years of um, university education, uh, meaning that I won't make any money, uh, you might get, you know, a stipend as a graduate student, certainly not enough to buy a Ferrari or something like that, whereas uh, if I stayed and worked at Intel, I would probably been able to buy a fancy car and drive around in nice places and a nice house and so on. I was in the west coast of US. But uh, I went to do PhD because what was clear is that in the long run, uh, whether who controls or who determines, who influences what you do uh, mattered to me. And if you're working for somebody and uh, if they have a certain end, end goal or agenda, ultimately you have to contribute to them. That's exactly why you know, they want you to work for them. Whereas, you know, when you are um, doing something like research, and there are other professions as well, uh, ultimately you decide what you do. Now, success or failure is up to you, and it's very risky in the sense that if you're not really good at it, you could fail, because you don't have you don't have a support system to lean on and say, okay, I'll change what I do or something, because you're, you're on your own. Uh, on the other hand, you know, you, you decide what you do. People may influence you, but you pick... You get to pick who influences you also. Nobody tells you what to do, right? So that's the main reason I went into research. And the other professions like this, of course, if you're an artist or a singer or a you know, um, painter, you would do the same thing. Now, those are much harder. My son once asked me whether to go to college uh, when he was a teenager or to become a rock star. I said, by all means, you should become a rock star, but the chances of uh, becoming a rock star is one in one billion or one million or something. Right. I mean, how many rock stars are there? Six billion people, maybe there are a few hundred, a few thousand maybe, so it's one in one million maybe. Whereas, uh, you know, go to college, get an education, chances of actually making a living are really good. And, you know, in, in the rock star, I mean, if you're not rock star, you're basically nothing. So at least there's a, research is not as bad as rock star. You don't have to be, um, you know, you don't have to be mid or something like that. But um, it is... Uh, it is uh, not. It may not seem as cool. One of the things I'm going to do is to today to convince you that it's actually more cool than even a rock star, and we can make rock stars dance. And then uh, the other thing about it is that you know you can also be an entrepreneur, right? Where if you start a company, of course you build something, and that's also I think very creative, you know, sort of an enterprise. Or you can start a university like this. But each of them, you know, requires a certain order of magnitude of experience, risk taking, and training, and so on. So in some sense. Research, while it's risky, it's clearly not as risky as becoming an entrepreneur or a rock star. So I settled for that. And uh, after my PhD, I was a professor at, uh, assistant professor at Yale University, teaching computer science, uh, doing research in computer vision. My research area was computer vision, which is basically processing, analyzing images and videos and things like that. And back when I finished my PhD, I was working on a problem on how to track uh, points in an image in a video from frame to frame to frame, where everything has moved, you know, given successive frames of video, you should be able to track them. So that I developed an algorithm for it. Later it got uh, adopted by the uh, movie, Hollywood movie industry, they used it in a number of movies and so on. But uh, I was not clever enough to patent my algorithm, I just published it, so it's not as if they're giving me any royalty or something. Now, if I had stayed at Intel and not done all this, by now I probably would have retired, because everyone who stayed at Intel back in the uh, early 80s became very rich, but you know, I spent a bunch of years going to university doing research, but I would claim that on the whole I'm having a lot more fun in what I do than a lot of my friends who did that, you know, who, who did not uh, go to PhD but who stayed in that job. So that's my story, but let me explain a little bit about what Microsoft is doing. So we have a presence in many parts of the world. Uh, these things that you see are all either uh, Microsoft research labs that we set up on our own, or in collaboration with some university, we may have a little bit of an activity. For example, uh, the one in um, you know I Labs in Israel and Gaming and so on, are like that. So the six major labs are in, in you know Bangalore where I uh, where I work, but Beijing, Silicon Valley, uh, Redmond, and Cambridge, uh, New England as well as Cambridge, England, the two Cambridges. Right? So now one way to measure the success of it. So if you're doing basic research, if you're not measured by whether you've actually contributed to a specific product. When Windows 8 comes, we don't ask in our lab how many of you have made a contribution to Windows 8. Or in fact, when they do the work, that's not what we're doing. So we have to have some way of evaluating how we have done. 
And one of the best ways and the you know, um, way that's been proven over time to assess research productivity is in terms of the number of uh, publications. See, research is ultimately a game that's a social game in the sense that what you do has to be reviewed by other people who are researchers and, and they have to believe that you're doing interesting things. Because what you do may be too advanced for practical implementation and evaluation you know, as, as, an, you know, as a product or something in the real world. So, and many of it may be theoretical, it may be mathematical, you know, it may be a prototype of a system sometimes, or it might even be a bit more applied. But whatever it is, it doesn't have, you haven't had enough time for it to be tested out, out in the real world. So in the marketplace for ideas and research is really the peer community. And what happens, all the researchers that work in different areas, uh, you know, publish their works and present them in conferences and journals. Uh, you know, in many fields, uh, chemistry, physics, mathematics, uh, even many fields of engineering, have very well-known and respected journals in which you publish your work. It's very hard to get them published because the review process is quite uh, tough. And uh, if you do get uh, an article published in it, then you, think, you, know, you become a hero. Uh, but in computer science, a strange thing has happened. The conferences where people get together and present their work have taken somewhat a lead over the journals. And the journals tend to be a bit slow. The ideas are moving really fast. And to get papers published in conferences in, a, in computer science is actually very difficult. The acceptance rate is uh, less than 25% many times, so you, know, you have one in four chance to get papers accepted. And you get the most fresh and uh, decent idea. So we look at publications and conferences as well as journals as a metric of how you succeed. If you can publish something, that means somebody in your peer community must have believed that this was interesting. Right? And the other thing is that if you don't publish your research, when you hide it in the dark, eventually it rots. Because research needs a lot of you know, sunlight, like people and plants, like all creative things. Of course, we do uh, impact Microsoft products. This is not to say that you know we don't care about Microsoft products, but our point is that rather than being constrained by the agenda that the product groups may have and the time frame that they may have, we would first do our research and then look for opportunities you know where the, our interests, our work, as well as the business interests and, and you know the strategy of the product groups. I mean, every product that comes out of Microsoft pretty much has something from Microsoft research. Um, I don't know how many of you know, there has been a significant in, in improvement in the search quality of Bing over the last two years. And now, you know, it's considered sometimes better than so Google, uh, company does Google and so on, or at least as good. And that, uh, a lot of it, credit to the kind of work uh, partnership that happened between Microsoft Research and, uh, and our product group. And of course, all of you have heard of Kinect, right? Xbox Kinect? Yeah, so that is very much an idea that came out of research. I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So... Now, one question naturally is that we have this research lab. Microsoft Research was set up 20 years ago in the US. We came to India seven years ago. Why did we come to India? Apart from the fact that I wanted to come to India and I'm very good at talking anybody into giving me whatever I want. So that's obviously one reason why we came to India. I just had to convince my management. But the real, real uh, reasons, at least the pitch that I made was, uh, even though India may not have a huge research culture, it has a strong engineering education and talent pool. Indian engineers, you know, are now, you know, uh, leaders in pretty much all areas that we work in. And in, in Microsoft especially, at any time, something like uh, 15 to 10 to 15 percent of the engineering staff were of Indian origin. They, you know, wherever you look. And Bill was very sensitive to the contributions made by Indians to the computer industry and so on. So it wasn't that hard to sell the idea that India, obviously, in a country where all these talented people come, obviously has more educated, more uh, willing, more creative, more disciplined, uh, talent and of course India itself you know is on a uh, path upwards the curve maybe is not as steep as China or as steep as we would like it to be but it's certainly growing even at a time when the rest of the world faces recession India is growing and the aspirations are going you know when I finished my BTEC in 77 I was lucky if I got a computer maintainer job with a very good degree and the aspiration was not really to see India lead it was really to get a job and, and settle down now you folks I'm sure when you when you you know when you are thinking about your future are not so thinking so narrowly. I mean, you, the world is open to you. You can shape the future. And in fact, one of my great worries about your generation is that uh, the parents are still uh, dominant, and then you're not doing sufficiently enough to challenge them and to go off and do something something on your own. And that's something I'll like talk about later. And of course, you know, because India is a very unique country with uh, 1.2 billion out of which. 
more than 650 million are uh, borderline poverty line and about 300 million are clearly in poverty. Uh, the you know, literacy rate is less than 60% and the number of people who live in rural you know, areas of India is still over 700 million. So, you know, the challenges there in terms of lifestyle, opportunities, technology, literacy, pose uh, for researchers a very unique set of research problems that we may not uh, see as well. So that's another reason to come to you. And uh, the challenges are really, you know, in, in the computer industry in India, although the Indian IT industry is very dominant world leading, there's very little R&D work, it's still service sector work. People are looking at careers as programmers, not even as product developers. And I think this is a big gap that we have to overcome. Uh, there's very little basic research. There's almost no basic research in the Indian industry. And, you know, the Indian academic research has not really grown all that much. To give you a statistic, the number of uh, people, uh, students gra graduating with PhD in computer science out of all of US universities every year is about 1,800. Last year might have been 1,700, 800. You know, it's, it stays around that. These are just in computer science. Okay, so other, other fields of engineering, more. I, I know computer science, so that's what I talk about. I don't want uh, senior people, I want to ask one of the students out there, what do you think is the number of uh, PhDs graduating in, uh, out of Indian universities, all of India, everywhere? in computer science, one every year. Just someone give me a number. Don't be afraid, you were, you know, you, you, you were more likely to be optimistic than this. No, never mind. I gave it away already. Give me a number. Uh, you're pretty close, actually. It's about 100, not quite at 150. And seven years ago, when we started the lab, it was the number was about 35 or so. And so, research is not really coming to play as a, as a, as a primary uh, kind of thing to do, even in leading Indian universities, which is one of the reasons why when, you know, Rajiv Shabri and Mr. Pawar invited me to chair the research advisory board, I very gladly took it up, because every opportunity we have to convey this message and do something about it, I think is very interesting. Uh, should also mention, what percentage of the 1,800 US PhDs in computer science do you think are of Indian origin? Like people like you, maybe. Sorry? About 25, not quite 35. We have China to handle. So, so that suddenly tells you that there are more you know, Indians out there. But one of the things we, when we set up the lab is that we realized people of Indian origin who were getting their PhDs were eager to come back and do research and giving them an opportunity. We were established by you know, Kapil Sibyl. Um, now it's been seven years. I'll give you a quick view of uh, where we are. We have 54 people. When we started, we had four people seven years ago. We have 54 people. And out of which 34 are PhD and about Seven or eight more do research but don't have a PhD. Uh, they come from all over the world. The PhDs come from major US universities such as Berkeley, and Stanford, and MIT, but also Indian Institute of Science and some of the IITs. This is just the Rogues Gallery. Um, when I think about the lab, I think we have basically three major aspects, which is uh, to do the research, which is about 40 people. Uh, we have a group of engineers who interact with product groups and work with our researchers to facilitate tech transfer. So our researchers don't get bogged down in it, but you know, this is like an intermediary group, there are about seven or eight engineers. And we have a small group that works with the outside world, um, works with universities, industry, government, policy matters, and things. They're only small, there are about four people. In the now, one, you know, and one of the signature things as the, of the lab has been, actually, has a, we have a huge intern program. We get about 100 interns every year, um, about 30% from abroad and 60% from India. And uh, over the seven years we have graduated, I would say about 550 interns from all over the world. And these are people who are not there as, you know, in computer term, computer science there is this delegatory term called code monkey. So it's someone who you hire just to code something up for you and go away. In fact, what the, when we hire interns, they are here to learn how to do research. They may stay anywhere from 12 weeks to 24 weeks or more, typically three months the summertime, but sometimes people come in off season as well. But they are there to learn how to do research. So in the first day, typically what happens is uh, most of the Indian uh, you know, students, these are primarily B.Tech students and some M.Tech students, very few PhD students, since there aren't many. They come and you know, go to their mentor and say, Sir, what do you want me to do, Sir? And um, the first thing we tell them is, uh, you cannot say Sir in this lab. So every time you say Sir, you have to give us 100 rupees. And um, you know, some of the students I know apparently have gone back having made no money in all of the summer because they paid it all out for Sir. And, uh, and then we tell them, I don't know what you should do, just go learn what everybody is doing and come back and tell me what interests you, then we can talk about it. So we try to really get them to first begin to think on their own, which is really what research is all about. Uh, 
So we have this other group of people we call research assistants and research engineers or developers. And these are people who have a bachelor's, master's degree, don't have a PhD, who we are not looking at keeping in the long term. So it's a little bit like an apprenticeship. They come, spend two years. You can think of a long-term internship if you want, but they've already got their degree. They spend two years in the lab working as a researcher and then go on to do uh, different things. Many of these people end up uh, going to apply for PhD and go usually abroad, some not, um, you know, to do PhD. Some of them uh, don't, and I think it's one story I want to share is one of our first research assistants in the lab was uh, Uday Power, which is uh, who's Mr. R.S. Power's son. How many of you might know of him? How many of you know Uday Power? That's the reason you should know. So he's, uh, he's one of the few of our research assistants, and he's one of the more creative ones. I'll talk about some things he did. But he's one of the few who decided not to pursue research as a career. Do you know what he's doing? Sorry? So he's trying to become a movie director. So if you saw the movie, Ace All is in that he was the chief assistant director. I think, frankly, you know, he's taken a much harder path than research. So we you know, give him all the support for that. Uh, of course, you measure your research uh, you know, uh, lab and its impact by the kind of recognitions people get outside, and Dr. Ravi Khandan is a senior person in computer science algorithms, and he recently won something called the Kunuth Prize. How many have, heard, have you heard of Kunuth? Oh, there are a few computer scientists here. Okay, that's good. I mean, if you haven't heard of Kunuth, you better go and quickly learn. Anyway, there's a prize named after him, which is the best honor you can get in algorithms, and, you know. And uh, I wouldn't mention there's one person here who's closely related to somebody in this uh, university who recently won uh, you know, a recognition as well. So we have young and old people. As I said, you know, publications is a way of measuring how you do, and we have over 100 publications every year these days with about 40 researchers. So that's pretty good rate, and you know, usually get some prizes and the others. Uh, I'm going to skip this because I'm for this audience. So we've divided ourselves into nine research areas, and I'm not going to read through all of them. If you go to our web page, uh, research.microsoft.com slash India, you'll find out more about these areas and who's working on them and you know uh, what kind of projects that they are doing. And one thing we realized is that these are the nine areas in the circles. Same people usually end up working in multiple areas. So this is something that you find in a research environment is that even though people may come in as a certain expert, say in algorithms or vision or something, soon they'll, find, they'll be working in other areas by collaborating with the others. And I think that's where, that's where most, most of the magic happens, not when one sub-discipline person is working on their own sub-discipline, it's when you intersect with other disciplines and sub-disciplines, magic happens. Okay. So now that I've said about magic, I think uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the magic. Now, some of it is going to be biased toward computer vision because that's my area and I love it and I still want to talk about it. Most of the work that is, I'm going to talk about was not necessarily done in our research lab, done broadly at Microsoft World, Microsoft Research Worldwide, but some in our lab as well. So, have, have, any of you have heard of something called Photosynth? Okay, uh, somebody is nodding their head. That means you have heard of it? Okay, so, okay, I'll tell you what it is. So, see, you know, one of the interesting challenges is, can we construct three-dimensional models of uh, buildings and structures easily. This has been an open challenge problem for computer vision. People have worked on it for 30 years. Even I've uh, done a bunch of work on that. But it's always been very narrow, limited scale. And it's taken a fair amount of sophisticated expertise to use them. And the cameras had to be very carefully um, constructed, calibrated, and so on. But some time ago, about 2006, some of the researchers in MSR together with people in the University of Washington came up with the simple observation that if you look at the internet and if you type in you know something, you know, if you type in Nirvana for example, you might get a lot of pictures that are in uh, you know uh, anywhere anywhere on these days probably they're all on Facebook I suppose. But you know different times they are in different places. And they are on different views. And one of the key aspects of you know creating a full representation of a scene is that you have to see the things from many different views. Right? If you're just seeing the front of a building, that's all you get. But if I can see the front, the side, from up and down, I get a big picture view. Can I put it together and create a walkthrough? But in fact, people have taken all these pictures from different views, and they are out there for you to use. Can we just use those pictures without you know, having to know anything about who and when they took them? And that's the technology that was created. created. So these are some of the pictures. You know, that, um, the basic idea here is take the pictures of the same place, 
taken from different viewpoints, use some computer vision technology to construct a three dimensional representation and then allow people to explore it. So let me see if I can show an example of that for you. So this is live coming from the PhotoSense website. So I can try to explore. Okay, I'll pick something that's there. I want to pick something that has a reasonable number of uh, synths. I should have practiced this before because it's dangerous to do this from flash. Okay, I'll explore by that. Uh, so right now I'm just uh, you know going to the service by the way and uh, uh, looking at life. Here, see, I can go around and see the different views, but this is probably more important. We begin to see, Phil, can you turn the lights down here a bit? Because I don't know how easy it is. Some of these are fairly dark, so it's weird. So I'm actually, I'll do it again so you can begin to see. Okay. So I can look at the head from the different views, right? And something called a point cloud, or I can just look around it from a different place. See, the point cloud is the three-dimensional representation of this object, okay, so I can look at it. So instead of, in addition to, you know, having the shape, you know, what the object looks like, it also captures the shape. It's as if it's a collection of 3D points that are hanging in the world. Now I can look at it closely, look at it from different viewpoints, okay. zoom in, or I can overlay the point cloud with uh, you know the 3D view, so in the picture. So what you're seeing here was done automatically from the pictures that were there out there in the web. Nobody took them, but we can walk around the objects and so on. So I'll show a little bit more of this later in the, in the context of another demo. Okay. So going back to what I was saying. So this was a technology uh, that was developed. You know, with MSR in collaboration with the uh, University of Washington. Now, when we when we developed it, uh, you know, we did not know what application that would be. In fact, the technology behind it, the 3D reconstruction research, has been done for 20 years. But being then released this as a service that people can submit their photographs, you know, and have 3D models constructed and use them. You can do that too. The second example I want to give is something that is uh, we did as a lab project. This didn't actually get applied. Oh, sounds. This is not our research. They would be good at it. Right. So you will begin to see some interesting special effects such as that where you know how I mean I'm sure all of you have seen or heard of the movie Matrix, right? Where you know this thing is called the bullet time effect, where while the action is going on, you can change your viewpoint and look at it from different viewpoints. So it's a very interesting effect that I mean the Matrix movie signature effect. Um, but it took them, in order to do that in the movie Matrix, they had to construct a rig with 
135 cameras that were looking at the scene from 135 different viewpoints and when they want to show it, they would switch which camera you know, that they were rendering it from. That's basically how you saw it. This group of people who are subscribed to breakdancers went to win a breakdance competition in the UK soon after this. I don't think it has anything to do with this video, but I'm glad they did. And you see some background things in defocus and the front, you know, in focus. These are the kind of effects that movie directors are always trying to achieve. But it requires a fair amount of control of camera and managing the views and things like that. You had to watch out for a place where there's this Trinity effect. You remember Trinity from Matrix? Yeah, and this, uh, you know, the kind of uh, overlay, time lapse effect. The main point is, yeah, there's a, uh, you know, changing of the viewpoint, so you can you can move around in both the space and time very easily. And that's something, you know, uh, it's, it's very difficult to do uh, with, uh, with in reality. So here we tell you how we do. These are the researchers, you know, the names there, not the ones that are passing. All camera movement within this video was virtual. Eight stationary calibrated cameras were used to shoot the film. For each camera, depth maps and matting information was automatically extracted. The one on the right this information used for automatic view right. interpolation and object editing. No manual touch-up was done for this video. The virtual footage may also be generated and manipulated in real time. So the key, the point here is, by just by having uh, seven or eight regular HD video cameras sitting on a rig, not 135, but all of them are collecting the video at the same time. But now we can analyze the videos and construct a three-dimensional representation. What we call the depth map is a map is a representation of how far objects are from the camera. So brighter pieces of that were near the camera. So that's a three-dimensional representation of the world. And simply based on that, we can reconstruct any interpolate any view, and that's how this was done. So it's give you an idea of, you know, how important, um, you know, no, uh, being able to appreciate the scene is. And the reason I'm showing it to you is because this is the kind of stuff that we do in a research lab. <laughs> uh, now, of course, most of you have heard of Kinect, but Kinect actually started as an internal project called Metal, and this was, a, you know, one of the great examples of where the you know real the real bit world of business and products meant research when the uh, Xbox team had this idea <coughs> they came to our researchers and uh, talked to them there were, uh, computer vision speech recognition and various other types of user interface so this is yeah. <laughs> this is the marketing video. <laughs> How many of you have uh, used the Kinect or Play? So you know what it's like, right? So the main point here is that you don't need a controller. The export, the Kinect sensor is actually watching you. It has a couple of cameras and an IR camera. And it's understanding what you're doing with your body and using that in the game. So you're controlling the game just by moving without having to hold uh, any kind of a game controller. That's the reason why it's very popular. Then, of course, now we've taken games away from geeky boys and given to girls. Now, this is probably not a bad thing. Mothers may not appreciate it. This, this is about. Until now, if you wanted to measure the movements of parts of somebody's body, you'd need some kind of a device like a remote or a marker. But now, in the time. He's the head of our Cambridge research. The body research. itself is the input device. Project Natal allows you to control your character, your games, your entertainment experiences through movements of your body. This is the dream of every researcher, taking their blue skies research and seeing it. It is a very young research, not much older than many of you. my group come from all walks of life, from musicians to artists to algorithmic developers, to researchers, to product people. The way that we incubate is essentially to actually embrace all of these different work styles the first time you discover something new that you love. 
that's what the first moment was like when I walked up to the sensor, gestured, and saw that come to life on the screen. We knew we had something when we took the first demos that were using the skeletal tracking technology and we actually had people using every part of their body. Not only were they smiling, but they said, hey, I was actually there. One of the brilliant things is that the 3D camera for the first time is going to be available. That gives you the three-dimensional information about the distance to every point on the body. But it doesn't actually give you an interpretation of where the limbs are, what the angles of the joints are. So for that, we need to build software. What the tool does is it evaluates is another percentage of the body configurations every frame. We may do that 30 times a second. The person playing with Project Natal doesn't mean to change their actions action. or change their behaviors to fit the technology. Natal technology actually changed itself to fit the way that the player plays. I think this is one of the most successful applications. He is like one of the young researchers that really did a lot of uh, uh, it's 50% hardware, 50% software. The beauty is that we have the ability to tie those together in a magical experience. From the technology side, our goal is just to make that absolutely seamless. You act, you don't understand. Okay, I'm going to move on. Okay. So now I'm going to switch to some projects that were done out of this lab. And I have to show this here because uh, the person who is responsible for this is actually Uday Power, the short time that he spent in the lab. And the way this happened is actually an interesting story. Back in those days, and still, people are looking at how computers can be you know, influential in education. Right? So the idea is that India has you know, so many villages, there are not many schools in villages, maybe it's one school for every so many villages, but they're not very good schools, they're not teachers, they're not even classrooms often, there's no technology, and the teachers don't know much about what they're talking about. So can we bring in technology? Can we give students computers and open it to them uh, open it, open it, no, open the world to them rather, and can they use it? Well, the problem is, uh, you can give them the computer, but you can't maintain it, you can't provide power for it, you can't, you can't teach people how to use it very easily, and you can't support it in the long run. Right? So those ideas have not really succeeded. However, when uh, you know when our researchers went to villages, an interesting thing about the group that's working on this has a few social scientists as members of the group. They are not all computer scientists. Some of them are social scientists, some of them are computer scientists like ethnographers and anthropologists, when they go to the village, the one thing they notice that whenever there is a government school, they usually have a computer. And that's because the government gives them a computer. But not get, it does not get very used. However, uh, parents actually send them their children to the government school over private schools because they have a computer, because the parents think if there is a computer, the students will learn something about using the computer and then grow up and get a job right, in the computer industry, any, any job. So there is a certain magnet, but the computers are not really used. They are not used by the teachers because the teachers don't know how to use them. What happens is typically some students uh, take initiative and start using the computer. So the scene up there, uh, you know, sorry, the scene this is backwards by the way, my mistake. This should, the one below is before, one below, above is up there, so I can do real time editing on my slides. Let me move this one. Okay, now it's correct. If science were this easy, man. <laughs> I'm also saying this so that. So what they found was that one or two students would know how to use it and they would be using it and all the other students would be crowding around them. And you know, all the other students were either jealously or cheerfully watching them, cheerleading them, but they don't get to learn how to use it. Typically the person uh, you know, who dominates would be, and as you might expect, a boy, not a girl, and would be typically from the upper caste or upper class in the village. So Uday made an observation that if instead of doing that, we simply connected multiple mouse or multiple mice to the same PC by you know uh, taking a USB fan out, and then we built some applications that require students to actually all work together. So, for example, there may be some kind of a learning game where different students will have to participate. It might be a guessing game or something like that. Each student will be provided with a mouse and a cursor, you know, appropriate colors, so red, green, blue, whatever, and then uh, you know 
they will have to work together. So this is all this is all he thought of. This is what we have then implemented. It was not all that difficult. And then we went in and uh, tested it in the schools and it was extremely popular. So the picture after. Now we have all the students actually one mouse each working together. All it did was simply get the students more comfortable using the computer. Very simple idea, but being very successful. We have actually uh, developed an SDK and gave it to uh, you know companies which make products on education. It's called MultiPoint, and there's an SDK and there are people are making products uh, regarding that. So that's something that you know we did. The second project is also equally interesting in that uh, we had a researcher called uh, Rikin Gandhi, and uh, no relation to the other Gandhis, you know. Uh, he actually grew up in the U.S. and wanted to become an astronaut, and he went to you know got his degree and was about to join. Yeah, you know you have to go through U.S. Air Force training to become an astronaut. And then he realized he didn't want to go to the military, so he came back to India. He had never lived in India, so he came, somehow you know, decided to work in our lab. And the problem that uh, he looked at was, when you go to villages and farmers are uh, you know, uh, doing things, many times they are not aware of how to do things better. There are actually about more than 1 lakh uh, agriculture extension workers in India, uh, sponsored by UN and the Indian government that go around trying to educate uh, villagers and farmers, but they're not very successful because there's just not enough of them. And the second is, they bring outside knowledge, whereas the farmers are more comfortable with their own inside knowledge. Right? They would rather listen to a neighboring farmer in the next village than this person who's coming from the outside and who has never actually done agriculture on their own. <laughs> so we thought of creating a peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing network for villagers. So of course, we should use computers and the internet, but there is no internet in the village, there aren't enough computers. But guess what is available in every village in India and almost uh, every household in every village? And DVD player, right? So what we did was to actually collect these uh, video presentations, just 10 minutes long, shorter, about a farmer talking about something that they did and show how they did it. And then created you know, some uh, databases, burnt DVDs, took them to other villages where we you know, had somebody in the village who kind of moderated and explained it. And this was the simple, you know, peer-to-peer -peer model. It became so successful that uh, we couldn't manage it anymore because there are too many villages that were interested. So we spun off uh, an NGO called Digital Green. So it's no longer part of our lab. And Digital Green is a legitimate NGO that's based out of Delhi. Rikin actually is in Delhi. He's got a lot of external funding. Uh, I think he's got about a billion dollars from the Gates. No, billion dollars from the Gates Foundation. A billion. Would be nice. Yeah. Um, you know, to, to, and he's in any number of villages in central India and, and North India. So this is another kind of research, you know, tech transfer to the real world. It was not to Microsoft because obviously I don't see what Microsoft would do with something like this. Something that we have done more recently, again in the Indian context is, um, many, you know, we all know cell phones are uh, everywhere in India. There are 600, I think I heard the numbers are there, 550 million um, kind of uh, cell phone users. And there are 800 million uh, SIM cards. In other words, people have multiple SIM cards and whatever, but there are only 550 million users. It's not going to be long before, you know, pretty much a billion Indians will have uh, cell phones. And in many cases, if you go to remote parts of India, in Chhattisgarh and places like that, there's not a lot of information communicated. There's not newspapers or televisions, no reads and things like that. And many of these tend to be sensitive areas where you actually want to have a lot of, you know, communication. Uh, so that you know, so that people get real information as opposed to propaganda, and so there is an uh, organization called CGNet, for, uh, which we collaborated with. That basically we created a technology where people can call in, uh, talk about some incident, uh, you know, on the phone, and that would be saved in a server and recorded. Later, somebody you know, as a moderator would you know filter out you know some junk and so on. But then anybody else can call in using the kind of interactive voice retrieval. You know, in this case, we didn't have voice-based retrieval. Uh, which would be something we would like to do, but mostly by using, you know, pushing, pushing buttons, can listen to something. And this actually has been a very successful and being fielded in a number of places. A uh, number of other NGOs interested in using this, uh, besides CG and Instagram, we have built an SDK, which we are now trialing with a bunch of NGOs, so they can set it up themselves. So they don't need us to go and, you know, uh, do, the, do it for them. And it also actually has some interesting impact where Regular news media picked up information and, and uh, started addressing it, which you know helped the government a bit to address some issues that they weren't even aware of and so on. So, um, we have a group called Microsoft Research Connections. 
which is really not a research group but is working with universities in terms of uh, trying to introduce the research ecosystem in India. I won't go and read through all of them. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that they do a number of events every year. We do a summer school and, and now a winter school on different research topics. The summer schools are taught by the leading researchers in the area. We get about 8 to 10 uh, speakers really from all over the world who spend about two weeks and we get uh, five, we take about 500 applications and select about 80 students from all over India. Uh, usually it's held at the Indian Institute of Science Bangalore campus which is near where our office is and, and they spend two weeks learning about subjects and anything from cryptography to software engineering to you know, mobility networks and systems, even the ICT for development, all kinds of topics. We've covered about seven topics in the seven years that we have. We've started also having winter schools. And we have a big event called Tech Vista which we do once a year which is really addressed to people, you know, more at your age group and level who are not PhD students, uh, bringing world class speakers to speak about what they do, not Microsoft employees necessarily. These speakers are leading researchers in computer science and related areas. They are usually one of the highest honors and awards, and they are usually very good speakers. Uh, and we do this, uh, we do a lot of outreach to get about 1,500 students and other people to come and listen to it. Most recent one was held Last month in Kolkata, we had about uh, 1,800 students from all over you know, Kolkata, nearby colleges and so on, and we had four or five speakers. We have had it in Delhi once, Bangalore two or three times, in Chennai, so Pune, and we kind of move it around, we'll probably come back to Delhi one of these years. And so the goal here is really, you know, uh, propagate. Now, uh, especially for that, I have to do this. This will be the last thing I will do. Uh, one of the things, you know, when we looked at that photosynth that I showed you, it occurred to us that there's a great opportunity to capture cultural uh, you know, monuments and, and show them to people. But just showing a demo is not uh, satisfying. Okay, now, this is the old version, which hopefully will still work. Okay, there's a problem with the uh, green screen uh, size. Okay, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, so let me just go ahead and do it anyway, even with the problem. Okay, so just so that. India is a country known for a religious and cultural diversity. This is a demo we put together about five or two and a half years ago. And more than 20 major languages, India's art, architecture, and cultural heritage are inexhaustibly rich. Her repertoire brings with priceless paintings, sculptures, crafts, and This is like any documentary that you might have seen, right? With India has a lot to look at with pride. India's monuments are the speaking stones of her intricate political and cultural history. This project hopes to explore some of her splendor through a rich, immersive multimedia experience. Select a monument from the list to explore it in detail. We have only one here. You have chosen to take the history and legend guided tour of the Sri Anna And you see the Photosynth logo. Here we have leveraged Photosynth. This temple dedicated to Sri Anna. So this just looks like a picture that we are scanning through, but I'll stop it here. Lord Vishnu, which is said to have been built during the 8th century oh, AD. Used to be possible. Awesome. Andal is perhaps one of the most famous poet saints of the Hathi movement in South India. Her life reflects the peace and Okay, now I will pass it. But if I now zoom out, you see that it's actually a panoramic image but constructed by stitching together a lot of images. Okay, so you're not really looking at a single picture. You can zoom into a different place as much as you want. You know, it's a very high resolution, high definition image and explore it. So while the narrative is going on, many times when you're all watching documentaries, we would wish you want to stop it right there and look at something more, right? And you can't do that. Here we are providing a way to do that. This virtual tour will tell her story and point out the key aspects of the rituals important. of worship. In the courtyard. This is the inner courtyard. <coughs> Hindus trace a clockwise circumambulatory path around this part of the... And now you begin to see those point clouds you find photosynth. The it's a three-dimensional construction. Depicting the numerous incarnations of Lord Vishnu. But I can stop it. Scenes from Andal's story. So rather than uh, all following the thread, I can look at this. So I can zoom in. And if you, you know, more time you can actually read the poetry. Okay, or I can stop it, you know, go around, walk through it the way I like. 
you have to be a good gamer to do these things and not see. Or I can just continue where it's left. As well as seeing Commander's story. Okay, so let me stop that because uh, it's just a time. This is the woman who is married to you. She's also a dancer. She's a researcher in our lab. She was a researcher. She left to go to work at an NGO in the US. And last year she won MIT's uh, TR35 um, award, which is you have to be a bright young researcher under the age of 35 doing interesting things. Now, this, is, this led us to think about. Um, oh, I know what's going on. <coughs> think about how you know, we can scale this. So, we talked to the government of India, and the government you know, um, uh, conducted a few workshops, and they started a project called India Digital Heritage which actually brings together technology people doing research in graphics, vision, and other kinds of technology, as well as what we call culture people, people who are you know, historians, art historians, anthropologists, architects, who know about uh, this stuff, together to capture our heritage and tell stories about it, how technology can be you know, used to do so. It's a research project in the sense that you know, with 22 people and uh, seven pros, you don't expect to cover a lot of monuments, but the idea was to come up, come to an understanding between these two communities on how art, culture, and technology can work together in the context of capturing and preserving and storytelling about heritage. Projects been going on; um, it's already one and a half years old. Uh, the projects have come on quite, quite, quite far along. The 23 projects, <coughs> probably a year or two, you know, we'll have a big. Uh, uh, there'll be a demo. Uh, you know, that will showcase some of the work that's done. The site that they have picked is Humpy as the site where everybody is trying to focus their energies. And, you know, we are not involved in the project directly because, you know, we don't take external funding, but we support people who work on it, as well as we are involved in, you know, um, setting direction and things like that to the government. Now, this led us to one thing, which is, we realized, the demo that I showed you, which, you know, although it was very cool and elegant, has a fundamental problem. It, you know, the picture taking was easy. About seven of us went to the temple, spent a weekend, um, you know, together with a bunch of monkeys, and took a lot of pictures. We took about six thousand or seven thousand pictures over a weekend of three or four days, just using any camera, cell phone camera, ordinary camera. We came home, processed it, and uh, in fact, we used to process it every evening in the hotel itself. But uh, it took us about two and a half months of one software developer, with, you know, with uh, working together with the design person to put together the demo. The design person came up with the storyboard, what to say, the software person actually implemented it and so on. So, if we want, if we want this to be used widely, that's not going to work. So, instead we thought of how can we make it so that anyone can tell stories and that is a key aspect of what we did which seemed to be important, which is normally you operate in two modes with the media. One is what we call cinematic narratives that we are passively watching, right? I mean, you all watch National Geographic uh, documentaries or Animal Planet documentaries or something like that, right? About lions fighting with, uh, you know, uh, bison or something. And or, or about temples and Taj Mahal and so on. But you cannot really touch it. On the other hand, you can go to a website about Taj Mahal or Humpy or animals and actually look at it. When you do that, there's not someone there to tell you what's going on. There's no history, there's no context, right? Whereas the documentary is nicely put together, someone is you know, telling you, can we combine the two experiences where, you know, while you are watching it, you can stop and then explore, but then continue to do that. Number one. Number two, traditionally, you know, we only think of two media, video, you know, or pictures that we explore through. Now we have these other medias like Photosynth, or deep zoom and high resolution images, or video or text. Can we actually leverage all those medias in the context of this? So we put together, we are building a platform of rich interactive narratives, which will allow you to do that. Let me first show. I hope I don't, you don't mind if I take a few more minutes. So here's an example of something that we did. Sorry. Yeah, this is also live, by the way. I think the connection speed more than two megabits per second. Let's try it. Let's try it. <laughs> So this is, oh, where did it go? <laughs> so how many people have a class right now at 11.30? Okay. okay, this is uh, coming down the internet you know, from a server. Okay. 
Heavy rainfall in some cloudbursts on the 4th, 5th, and 6th of August 2010 in Ladakh set off a series of flash floods and mudslides that resulted in loss of homes, lives, and caused severe damage to infrastructure. And Once again, you know, while this seems like a documentary, what we are looking at is a panoramic image, so you can zoom in and explore it where you want, not that different from what I showed you in the other demo. But if we go a little bit farther here, um, something interesting happens. Yeah. A series of villages that spans from Crowded to so this is a map. So instead of you know going through the narrator's version of the map, I can actually change the map and I say, you know, I want to see a road map. And you can look at it. See the road map, zoom out, go to any other place in the map, explore it, or maybe I want to see aerial with some labels. I can do that and zoom in as much as I want. And this is all happening live, by the way, you know, from the big maps and so on, and continue with the and its path. Okay, so we also put together a table of contents like thing. And um, go to, see if I go to, okay, yeah. okay, this is a section with architecture where it actually uses a photo of the down and kept the new moisture. The new go. By Dongkar Barma is a large single room with brightly painted pillars and elaborately painted murals. So here is a photo of the tell the story, right? Striking you can use images or video or maps or photos of any of these things to tell the story. As one enters the Gompa, immediately across the entrance is a statue of our the Bodhisattva of Compassion. Now the more interesting thing is, that was one example, I'll show you the next example and then I'll close. But if you have a laptop or a computer with a with a browser, any browser that supports Silverlight, you can actually do this yourself. You don't, you know, you don't need me. But uh, and in, okay, here yeah, this is a cool one. As so this one, by the way, was put together in less than half an hour. This doesn't. This uses a kind of technology or tool that you might not even normally think of when it comes to narrators and storytelling, which is the one reason that it's uh, we're talking about. So Ajay, last week I was at this um, Bangalore bird race and uh, we were talking about critically endangered birds in India and we were interested in looking up this bird called the Jordan's Courser. So I fired up this application. So this is an application um, called Pivot. Which helps me visualize all these different kinds so of that I'm endangered really cool. species. And I started looking for the bird and I typed up the name in a search pane <laughs> and we found it almost immediately. So that's if you're sitting next and to him and he's doing it, right? If you click on the bird's using it. image, you can find out that, uh, you know, it's on the red list status, it's critically endangered, its population trend is decreasing and it's found only in India. Um, so what's interesting about this bird is it's endemic to this one region uh, in South India called Andhra Pradesh and it was believed to be extinct and it was only discovered This recently. is one of our researchers by the way. So you have to know all these kind of random things. I'm curious to explore to and I don't find know. out some more about endangered birds. So I went back to the main screen and um, you know we tried to sort this list by class and here so now we it's found showing out that you there were a lot of distribution. Uh, of the, so he's doing it right but I'm not tired of what he's doing. Countries. I can go in and say, well, I want to only look at vulnerable ones, to show you that, or whatever is called near threshold ones, or I can um, select based on family, right? and it'll look. so it orders, so you can actually in real time do the visualizations that you want instead of what he was doing, and uh, you know, continue the story whenever you want, so I don't know further, okay. 
just to finish my talk, um, this is something we have actually pretty far along. So the, what you saw here is the experience part. We have a player, but how do you actually create it? So we have created a data type called XRIN, which is allowing you to store these type of narratives and an authoring tool that designers can use. You don't need to know any programming or code writing or computer science. You just need to know how to tell a good story. And you can use it to create the stories, play them. And we are also developing an SDK for people to add new media types. We have supported a few media types. We can you know, extend it to others. And that's what we're working on. By the sometime, um, you know, later this year, we plan to release the authoring tool public so people can use them to create narratives and tell stories. So what I showed you in the Steve Lippetool demo uh, we should be able to make it possible for lots of people to do about things you know, that, that matter to them. Uh, I will stop there and thank you. And uh, you know, one, one, one thing about, I don't know, some, depending on the success or the failure of the lab, I may either be thanking or praying some God. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'm really sorry at this point time, but I figured uh, it was entertaining enough. Thank you very much. Uh, may I ask uh, Dr. Vidusani to present a small memento of our thanks to the speaker? Thank you very much. I got one of these two years ago when I came and gave a talk. I think I'll come every so often and have a little shelf for <laughs> Now, my, I think my parting message is, uh, you know, you are all in college. You are not clearly gone on to become rock stars or cricket players yet. Uh, probably too late to do that at this point, frankly, given you know, you're over 20. Uh, but uh, one place where you can exercise most creativity, most amount of freedom, and probably actually change society a lot more you know, than other people can is, is it actually uh, is, is doing science and do research in technology and science. I hope you know you also realize that it's fun. It's not this boring thing where you know people with thick glasses in some offices without windows do and looking at math books all the time. No, they may do that and they are probably smarter than me. But most of us actually have quite a lot of fun doing this. Thank you. Uh, those students who would like to stay back and uh, ask a few questions uh, are welcome to do so. Uh, but I know classes are running, so please feel free to go. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Anandan does have a few minutes to uh, stay back with the students and do our questions. I know there is a Thank you.